Okay, let's get things started. Hi everyone and welcome to PK's webinar, Is Test Data Holding You Back? How to Use AI and Machine Learning to Accelerate Test Automation. Before we get started, I just want to remind all of our attendees that if uh, you have been muted, but if you have any questions, there's a Q&A feature in the Zoom app and just use that to submit any questions you have and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. And any questions we don't get to, we will email, um, we will s provide responses in email um, following the, the webinar. Uh, right now, I'll hand things over to Ross Bentley, our Senior Director of PK's Test Ops Practice, and he'll get things started. Thanks, Linda, and welcome everybody. We're so glad you're able to join us today to talk about the issues around test data. Um, today's presenters include uh, Rich Lucas, a data scientist within our um, Digital Edge um, Technologies uh, Center of Excellence, uh, Krishna Kashyap, a solutions architect for PK's Offshore Automation COE. He spearheads much of our automation efforts and IP initiatives. And I'm Ross Bentley. Thanks again for joining us. Let's see what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to start by addressing the test data problem that uh, um, many of us have. Uh, we're going to look at machine learning as a potential solution. Uh, we're going to get into some of the details about building a synthetic test data platform. And then we're going to take a look at how it works. And like Linda said, we'll uh, be finishing up with a time of questions and answers at the very end. I also wanted to let you know there's going to be several interactive polls throughout the session that will appear on your screen and give you the opportunity to provide us with um, your answers. We'd love to get your feedback uh, during this session. And so if you could just uh, be so kind as to respond, we'll share that data in line. Those polls are anonymous. Um, we'll just be sharing the, the, the numbers from them where the answers align. Um, a little bit about us. Um, PK is an experienced engineering firm headquartered in Beaverton, Oregon. We have over 3,500 employees located in global delivery centers all over the world, including India, Argentina, Mexico, and all across the U.S. For over 16 years, we've partnered with industry leaders in telecom, finance, healthcare, transportation, tech, and retail to deliver solutions in strategy, design, loyalty, development, operations, analytics and big data, edge technologies, and automation. This webinar is a joint collaboration between our Digital Edge and Automation Centers of Excellence. A little bit about the services that we provide in the area of automation. We have two main areas of focus. The first is what we call test ops. That's really the test automation aspect of your delivery pipeline. Uh, we also have a full line of RPA services as well, robotic process automation. And across both of those, we provide assessment and strategy services, um, engineering and implementation services, monitoring and operation services, and a whole managed service line as well to be able to, to support whatever needs that you might have in automation. With that, we're going to start with our first poll question. And that question is, what are your top concerns in delivering quality code to production? Is it unstable environments, a lack of good test data, ambiguous requirements, merge dependencies and integration issues, the schedule and release timeline, or all of the above? You can select um, multiple answers if that uh, uh, works for you. Yeah, the speed of business has increased and with this current pandemic, it's become more obvious that our that our delivery pipelines are being challenged. What's holding you back? What's uh, Creating some of the problems that you're facing. We're going to leave the poll open for a little longer just to get the final answers in um, just encourage you to to make your selections now. All right, still coming in. We're almost finished. Just a few more seconds. And there we go. Okay, there you see it. Uh, lack of test data clearly um, is a challenge uh, to um, delivering quality software um, as well. A lot of folks are feeling the pain across um, all of these different areas. Um, thank you very much for that. So let's talk about the test data problem. 
we invest a lot in our automation solutions and have high expectations of them. Often as we come in and help companies sort through where they are, we find many challenges to test automation, including uh, application stability issues, test environment issues, tool and talent issues. But one of the greatest challenges our clients encounter when coming to realize the full value of test automation is test data. Test data challenges manifest themselves in many different ways. First of all, test data is costly to acquire and maintain. Additionally, it can be difficult. The, the data can be siloed, it can be managed by external organizations. Um, there are a lot of challenges with the fact that, that in many cases, your, your end to end test scenarios involve tests spread across interdependent systems, which creates additional challenging requirements on the test data itself. Another problem is that test data can have a limited scope and not cover our tests sufficiently. Um, data can expire and by the time you, you get it, um, it's not useful anymore and you need to get another version of it. And then of course, um, these days there are a lot of significant data um, restrictions and security regulations that prevent us from just being able to, to take some of the data sources that we used to use in the past to drive our testing. And we have the cost of data to test resources and release cycles. That's a significant um, impact on our testing. It's already a limited test cycle and it seems that the majority of our time is being spent either creating or waiting on test data. The result is we don't get to see the automation um, function the way we thought it would. What we expected was a finely tuned machine that uh, um, we would hope would purr and drive uh, high performance uh, automation results. Um, but the actuality we, is often that we get hampered by a lack of test data and we cannot um, realize the full power of the machine that we've built. Test can't keep up with the release velocity and costs start running out of control. So what we need is a test data strategy that addresses these issues and clears the bottlenecks so that we can get to the goal of releasing quality software at the speed of our business. That strategy needs to address security and compliance issues and reduce the risk of exposure of data. It needs to address quality concerns by increasing test coverage to, to make sure it encounters all of those edge cases and negative cases that we have. And it needs to be able to address our release cycle concerns by being easy to acquire and maintain, um, to be available on demand and allow our pipelines to flow smoothly and drive our costs down. This leads us to our next poll question. In what capacity does your company currently use AI and machine learning? Uh, maybe for prediction, uh, recognition and interaction, say in image recognition, voice recognition or chatbots, uh, security, fraud detection or prevention, uh, the creation synthetic data, user experience, um, or, or none of the above, maybe you don't know. How is your company currently leveraging AI and machine learning? All right, we're getting a good, uh, good response so far. Give it a few more seconds to provide your answers and then we'll share the results. All right, here we go. It looks like um, answer number two, recognition and interaction. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of chatbots um, in the industry as well as um, over the phone and, and interaction um, recognition. Excellent, thanks for responding. So as we just discussed, we need a test data strategy that can respond to our long list of demands. A recent Forrester report indicated that AI and machine learning will play a significant role in unlocking the benefits of the software delivery life cycle. That's where we decided to leverage the brain power in our digital edge center of excellence to find a solution to our test data problems. And so I'd like to introduce one of our data scientists, Rich Lucas, who's spent a lot of time working on solving this problem for many different clients. And he's gonna talk to us about what makes machine learning a great solution for solving our test data challenges. Rich? 
Hey, thanks, Ross. I'm uh, glad to be part of the team. So uh, the results from that poll that we just saw, about a third of our participants don't know how machine learning is currently being used in their organization. And so just to make sure that we're all on the same page, uh, we don't want the term machine learning to be jargony um, or uh, misunderstood. So we're going to make sure that everybody has the basic understanding about what machine learning is. So this is our, our, our um, introduction uh, to machine learning. Now we live in a world where um, machine learning is all around us and, and many of us don't even realize it. Uh, depicted in this cartoon on the left uh, we frequently buy items, and particularly if you're buying online, but then you're also presented with other items that might also be useful to you. Uh, that is the result of machine learning. If you're relaxing and you're watching movies, the movies that you're presented with are the result of machine learning algorithms working in the background. If you have a, if you or your kids have a playlist, once the playlist reaches its end, the music doesn't just stop, it keeps playing. Well, the songs that are played after the playlist ends are the result of a machine learning algorithm. Now, what all of these algorithms have in common is, number one, they're operating behind the scenes, we don't see them. Uh, number two, we benefit from them, uh, but more importantly, in order for these algorithms to work, there must be sufficient data on the subject matter at hand. Without, without those data, the machine learning algorithms don't work. And more importantly, there, need to be, there needs to be a recognizable pattern. Um, so at its most basic level, all machine learning is, it's just a computer algorithm that can recognize patterns and data. And then they can apply those patterns uh, to new data. That's, that's its most basic level. Now, some of the data that we have been presented with over the last few weeks uh, is all about the COVID-19 virus. Other data are perhaps more interesting, like the price of oil or what mortgage interest rates are, how many people are applying for mortgage interest rates. But but the, the COVID data have, uh, or the, the COVID-19 situation really has impacted all of our lives. Now this graph that I'm showing on the left, uh, you don't need to know very many of the details about it. What this is showing, it's the number of positive COVID-19 tests per 1,000 people from the end of January to the end of April in six different countries, and each country is represented by a different line. Now, I'd like you to all just lean back away from your screen right now. It's really not important which country is which line, but I want you to take a look at, at, at this graph, and I want you to look for some patterns. I would suggest that all of you can see that as time passes, as we go from January into March, every one of those lines has an increase in the number of daily positive tests. Some of those lines have more increases than others, but all of them show an increase. I'd also suggest another pattern that you can see quite easily is the top line, the green line, has more variation. It jumps up and then jumps down, jumps up and jumps down. It has more variation than some other lines. These are patterns that we can see as humans with our own eyeballs but there's also important patterns in the data that the humans can't recognize. Uh, computers, machine learning algorithms in particular, are quite good at finding those hidden patterns, patterns that are obfuscated or not recognizable to human eyes. But computers can differentiate the patterns that we can't see. And this is why machine learning is being employed uh, in many different uh, areas. One of the areas, again, talking about COVID-19 is in order to help us find a vaccine. Machine learning algorithms can help discern and, and recognize antibodies that can block potential binding sites in the human body, uh, and thus help 
potentially find a vaccine. Uh, machine learning can also be used to uh, predict when states or, or countries should reopen their economies. We've all heard a lot about that. Now, the ability of machine er learning algorithms to recognize uh, these hidden patterns is a real strength. And this is what we're exploiting uh, in order to solve the test data management problem. Okay, so let me, let me show, share another uh, interesting example of machine learning with you. This is the story of Nokia. During the first decade of uh, this current century, Nokia cell phones dominated the world market. I think a fun poll question would be, how many of us, how many of our listeners had a Nokia phone? I know I'd raise my hand, my first three phones were, were Nokia products. I bet you guys did as well. So in 2008 and 2009, a woman by the name of Trisha Wang, she was a technology ethnographer implied by Nokia. She was tasked with determining what share of the market Nokia flip phones were likely to maintain in the Chinese market. So she went out, she collected some data through surveys, uh, she employed some machine learning algorithms and her analysis, and then she got a report ready and presented it to the company leadership. And in that report, she predicted that uh, the market share of smartphones being used by the emerging Chinese middle class would increase dramatically. And conversely, that would mean that Nokia would lose market share. While her data set was small, there may have been some algorithmic bias at play, but uh, ultimately what happened was the company leadership disregarded her report. What happened is, uh, is a great business story. Uh, you can see the, the market share of Nokia in the, in the thick red line on the top, in 2008, 2009, but come 2010, there is a sharp decline in the Nokia market share. And at the same time, that yellow line, starting in 2009, increases uh, quite dramatically, which is what uh, Trisha Wang's report predicted. Now, Nokia leadership disregarded Trisha Wang's report because they had millions of data points suggesting that people would continue to buy and use small flip phones. Remember, in 2009, it was an open question if people would buy and use these large, expensive bricks that you had to charge multiple times a day and that broke every time you dropped them. Well, could this loss of Nokia market share have been avoided? I, I don't want to address that question very much, but the, the main point of this story is that the machine learning algorithms that Trisha employed were able to recognize patterns in the data that humans couldn't see. Humans could have made different decisions to change the outcome, but most importantly is that machine learning provides a real benefit and it's our job to help employ the right tool. Okay, so there's many examples of machine learning out there in the world. Uh, it can, the many different algorithms can in general be grouped into, into three main paradigms of machine learning. That's supervised learning, so when you have data to train a model. Unsupervised learning, that's when you, you don't have any a priori expectations about what the patterns in the data are, but you know that there's patterns and you use a, a computer to help you find the unknown patterns. And then there's reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning uh, deals with uh, robot navigation, uh, responding to stimuli, external stimuli. Now, I'd like to point out one particular example of machine learning uh, that has been commonly spoken about over the last few weeks few weeks, and again, it's concerning the COVID-19 virus. So as scientists and public health workers worldwide work to limit the spread of the COVID-19 virus, one of the basic tools that disease control uh, 
uses is contact tracing. The goal of contact tracing is to identify and alert people who have come in contact with an infected person. In this case, the coronavirus. Now, <clears throat> historically, this contact tracing was done manually with a pen and a paper and a map and usually a telephone or, or sometimes people, health, uh, public health workers go and knock on somebody's door and ask questions. But that took a very long time and it wasn't very efficient. In our current world, we can employ a much more effective method of contact tracing. So these cell phones that we all carry in our pockets, they're constantly communicating with nearby cell phone towers, regardless of if your GPS signal is on or not. Now we can use this location information to triangulate precise, pre precise positions. We can overlay those with the activities of people that we know to be infected. This way, we can much more rapidly find people who have potentially interacted with others infected with COVID-19. All right, so that's our, our, our basic rundown of introduction of what machine learning is. Now that we all have a, 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 a rudimentary understanding of machine learning, we'd like to talk about some real world business problems that PK has helped solve by leveraging our machine learning experience. Here's just two examples. So in healthcare, we've engineered an experience to help hospitals determine a patient's risk for readmission. Now, this is important because under current legislation, hospitals are financially penalized if they have higher than expected 30-day readmission rates. Now, some patients are higher risk than others at, at being readmitted into a hospital and in what we've done is we've helped our customers uh, determine which of those patients are in the highest risk category. This has allowed healthcare workers in the hospital to prioritize the patients that need to be prioritized and then decrease their 30 day admission rate and overcome this business problem and healthcare problem too. Um, in retail, we've engineered an experience that aids in the inventory management. Uh, of our customers. So in retail, a constant problem is product management. It's difficult to know how much of any given product should be kept on hand in stores. If stores have too much product, uh, they can't sell it all, and then the extra product that remains end up, ends up taking up valuable merchandise space. If too little product is kept on hand, then customers who feel like buying that product can't buy it because it's not in stock. And then the, the, the store could have made more money, but they in, in effect left money on the table because they didn't have product there to sell. So we've built a platform for our customers that employs machine learning to help maximize efficiency when it comes to inventory management. These are just some examples. PK has broad machine learning experience and has solved business problems for, for, for a, a a number of our customers and across various industries. So just like any exercise with computers, the input data are enormously critical. The data can come from different sources. They can be in the cloud, they can come from flat files, flat text files, they can come from databases. But all these data must be organized and knit together in a way that is meaningful and useful for the question at hand. Frequently, this data prep, prep, uh, preparation step is, uh, is iterative and uh, needs to be conducted uh, multiple times until the data set is structured correctly. Now, once this data corpus is available, machine learning algorithms can then be applied. Now, as I mentioned on a previous slide, not all algorithms are appropriate for every question. Some algorithms within a category work better with your data set than a different algorithm would. And so again, we must work iteratively to find the algorithm that works best and, and delivers the best result. Now, once a candidate model is identified, again, we need to work iteratively to test that model with data that we've reserved for that purpose, for testing and evaluation. Now, because our testing data have not been used in the training process, 
this allows us to quantify quite well how the candidate model performs. Now models that are satisfactory and, and pass the test, these are the ones that get deployed into the applications that we build. Now it's important that, that um, I, I stress here, this is not uh, a finite result. This is iterative. We are, this is a learning process. We're experimenting, we're testing hypothesis. Uh, we're iteratively improving when new data become available. And so even as uh, models are deployed into applications, they're constantly being updated. And it's through this iterative process that we're able to, uh, to continually learn and deliver uh, value. Now in the context of what we're talking about today, the lack of, of test data for a, for a test data management solution is this is a business problem and it's one that PK is good at solving. Uh, this is also one of the areas where machine learning shines because we can employ machine learning algorithms to search for, identify, uh, and recognize patterns. And then we can replicate those patterns in test data. So uh, we can help with this. Kashyap will tell you all about the solution we've come up with after our next poll. Thanks, Rich. That was great stuff. Um, yeah, so our next poll question is this. What percentage of your current release cycle do you currently spend on acquiring and managing test data? How much are you spending on, on test data as a part of a release cycle? Uh, lots of answers to choose there. Uh, pick the one that uh, applies to you the most. This is kind of getting at the heart of it. I know for my past experiences, there's a lot of pain here. Um, if you're not exactly sure, what does it feel like? Um, I know on some of the projects I worked on, both not enough and don't know, but it's too much, uh, felt, felt equally um, the answer. All right, and while we're, while we're answering this question, I also want to remind you to, to take advantage of the, the Q&A function within um, the webinar to submit any questions that you might have um, that we can answer at the end. All right, we can share the results. All right, well, that seems like a fairly solid answer and in, in up to a quarter of the time being, is being spent. That's a lot for, for an overall release cycle. Um, that's good, good information. So with that, uh, we'd like to start to talk about our synthetic data solution. How did we take the power of machine learning and apply it to test automation? Um, how does it really work within our test pipelines? Well, Kashyap is now going to tell us about that. Kashyap? Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Rich. Before we discuss about solution for synthetic data generation, let us look at the importance of synthetic data synthetic data itself. We are in times of stringent data regulations, right? Regulations like GDPR, CCPA have made compliance complicated, costly, and time intensive. Organizations have to look very closely at their data sets and make critical decisions to ensure compliance and data security. Synthetic data helps organizations in highly regulated industries that put customer data security and privacy first and that to keep their data operations frictionless and optimized while still being compliant. Just as a scientist may need uh, to, to, to produce synthetic material to conduct experiments at low risk, the data scientist at some point will, will have to produce synthetic or fake data that has the same or almost, same, or almost similar properties as the real one bigger data sets, right? So that's, that's a regular challenge most teams face is I mean, uh, that we have to have huge amount of data with the proper characteristics. Synthetic data can actually help teams to generate any number of records required for multiple phases of your SDLC, right? Including development, system testing, functional automation, performance testing, and UAT. <clears throat> the approach of the uh, regular um, that we do in, in today's world is, is a regular approach is importing sanitized data sets, right? which would mean uh, getting data from prod, 
masking it, maintaining golden backups, and restoring them. This is time consuming and cannot be done frequently. With synthetic data, we can generate data on demand without any dependency on, on a database backup. When it comes to non-existent data sets, I'll bring out two scenarios. So most applications deal with edge case scenarios, one-off scenarios for which finding data is really difficult simply because such cases never occurred or, or they don't exist in your pre-prod or prod backup that you have. Also, when we work with modern technologies or solutions like um, um, self-driving cars, right, so, something like that, right? So where the development phase or during the SDLC phase, you really don't have any prod data to even have a copy of it on your local environment. Synthetic data can be of tremendous help to the teams to generate data for these non-existent data scenarios. Going back to the example that I was quoting, right, of the self-driving car projects, Google's Waymo, which is, which is its project, completes miles and miles of driving in simulation each day. And synthetic data has been a great help for their engineers to get, to get the car tested before bringing it into the real world. Researchers have also used machine learning to generate data uh, required for their x-rays that, that can show different medical conditions, which in turn has been used by the healthcare teams to diagnose better. The diagram that you see on the top displays a high level process about how a synthetic test data solution can be built. If you see the process on the left, um, the input sample data is fed to a machine learning algorithm or a program that, that actually extracts the data characteristics or attributes and then produces synthetic data. As part of the solution, you can actually build an interface with a UI which can help uh, add an on-demand feature to the solution. Along with, this, along with this interface, we can also have a API or a web service that can be utilized by your dev and test teams to integrate into their solution. Let us look at the normal distribution curve at the bottom and try to understand uh, some info about it. For any regular application, majority of your data would be within the one sigma range, sigma being the standard deviation, right? Represented by the green color in this picture. This means that any test data required for application can be easily generated with the most basic sample data given to us. When talking in terms of machine learning models, this can be categorized as an unsupervised learning area where most of my synthetic data can be generated without much supervision or without much user intervention. The yellow area represents data that is two sigma away from your mean. To enable generate uh, data in this area, there would be some specific inputs required or provided by the user. This can be categorized as um, supervised learning uh, where minimal or some amount of user intervention would be required or some data has to be labeled to generate the required output. The red sections at the far end uh, represent data that is three standard deviations away from the mean. This area represents the data is not frequently found or those edge cases that we were talking about, right? For which data conditions might have to be explicitly provided. In, for these data conditions, we might also have to change our underlying algorithm that has been built right, to, to cover the data generation. So combining the one sigma, two sigma, and the three sigma, we should be able to achieve more than 99% of all your data possibilities. To build a synthetic data generation platform, we will have to consider these components, a layer that can extract data characteristics, a rule extractor engine to understand the relationship between different data points. Um, probably um, the engine should also accept rules that can be defined by a user. An algorithm layer that can generate and apply those rules to, to generate new data. Storing all these rules, characteristics and the synthetic data that has been generated. And also enabling proper usage of the data that has been generated on your applications under test or, or your end targets. Before looking into each of these components on the, on, on, into the first component, let us take a look at the input data. The input sample data is a logical collection of all possible data sets that have to be considered for your synthetic data generation. 
the more diverse and dense this data set is, the better the output can be. Metadata dictionary, as you can see, plays a very important role in understanding that input data that has been provided to us. Metadata dictionary becomes the foundation of your solution. We are essentially trying to extract the attributes of the data, store them as a dictionary and, and then persist them into a database. How can, I mean, let us take an example, as you can see on the screen, how can we identify or locate a book from a library of the books? The best way is we have an index that guides us to the right book, right? Similarly, metadata would behave like a catalog of the data characteristics. It would help us identify which exact data parameter is required, which data has to be generated, and what has to be its characteristics. Let us say if the data is customer ID, my metadata extracted solution should be able to extract attributes like data type, in this case, which can be number, whether it's an incremental column or is it's an ID, ID meaning it is a unique ID. Right? Once this extraction is done, these values are stored into a database for further usage. Now that metadata has been extracted, the next step would be understanding relations between different data points and defining them as rules. There can be some non-extractable rules that have to be fed to my algorithm too, based on what data is being fed as input. Right? So we'll, we'll come to some examples in a later point of uh, time. So my, my input data can be data from JSONs, XMLs, Excel, CSVs, or even tables. My rule engine should be able to parse any of these files and extract the rules. Another important component is the algorithm module, right? So this, this machine learning algorithm will be will, will use that metadata that was extracted and stored along with the rules that were defined. And uh, we can we can use any of the examples that Rich told us earlier, right? Reinforced learning or cluster-based machine learning algorithms. Some examples that we have actually used would be um, Narco chain algorithms or Gaussian mixture models, right? So along with using these algorithms to extract data, we can also use some libraries that, that can actually generate or fake new data, right? So we'll talk about them in the, in the next few minutes. Let me take an example of how this data generation can happen, right? On the left, you see training data. Consider, I, I've actually labeled them separately for, for better understanding. Uh, you can see four records under each label and the first one of each of the label pertains to the same row, right? If you put them in a data sheet or in a, in a table, consider them as the same row, right? So metadata of the fields like bin cycle at the bottom or a credit class as you can see, the metadata can be extracted as integer because the values are all numeric. Or if it is credit class, it's a single character, so it could be character. Uh, whereas for other uh, things like account type or band status, the metadata is string, and we can uh, we can extract the length if it is zip or if it is an ID. We can actually extract the length of the of the values and store them as a metadata. Some of the rules that we can extract is. What are the possible values for each of these uh, data feeds, right? Let us say credit class in this case, based on the training data set that is, that is being given to me, which is basically four records. The possible values for credit class can be Q, H, or B. I can only generate these three, right? Because I cannot generate a, a credit class like X because my underlying system will not be able to understand what X is because it doesn't have X as a valid value. Right, and, and, and another example of a, a rule would be, if you see um, relationship-based rule, right? Account type and account subtype. As you can see, account type, when account type is business, my account sub, subtype is commercial. When my account type is individual, my account subtype is regular, right? So that means when I generate data, I cannot have account type as business and account subtype as company use. It won't, it, it will not be a valid data set. That means when I my my rule extraction should be able to understand these rules, extract those rules, and maintain them as as a as a rule dictionary also in my database. 
So once the metadata is extracted and the rules are extracted, my algorithm should be able to use that content and then generate new data. As you can see on my on the on the on the right corner on the on the right side of the slide. So test data has different values than what has been there. So if you see first name, the in the training data set it is Abigail, Brindley, Chase, and Darian, whereas my new data is Wendy. So this is where we would use some of those faker programs or data generation libraries to really completely generate new set of data so that we avoid any kind of privacy issues that can arise with using a direct production data. Right. So my data set for credit class in this case would be H because it is only one of the values that has been given as part of my training data. So this is how we can actually apply machine learning to extract the metadata rules and then generate data that is relevant to your condition. We will see more about this in the, in the upcoming demos. Excellent, thanks Kashyap. So with that is our final poll question of the day. Um, we wanna ask you what current test data management tools do you use? Um, you can select whichever ones from this list apply to you. Maybe you're just modifying a copy of production. Um, uh, maybe you develop a homegrown tool or some manual processes. Or maybe you have an army of uh, manual data generators or any one of the licensed or desktop tools that, that are out there. Take a few moments. Good. Lots of answers coming in. All right, so uh, a few more seconds, we'll leave it open and then we'll present the results. Okay, it looks like uh, final votes are in. Um, as you can see, many of us are uh, either using a manual um, tool like Microsoft Excel or some, some homegrown method or, or something else. Um, a few of us are still working on production and that's uh, Gonna have to work on fixing that. But with that, let's, uh, Kashyap, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to talk more about uh, the TDM platform. Thanks, Ross. Now that we have seen uh, how, can, uh, how can we build a solution to generate synthetic data and store the data, next we will take a look at how do we enable the usage of such data for a real application, right? Before we go deep there, most organizations would need test data as part of their testing phases. Building a UI and enabling users to provide conditions on which they need data can be really helpful in, gen in, in generating data for those edge conditions and, and off, off scenarios so, and, and, and then integrate the TDM solution with the DevOps pipeline. To integrate the DevOps pipeline, we don't really have to use the UI. Instead, we can make an API call and invoke the synthetic data generation uh, logic. That can be very handy uh, since uh, it can be seamlessly integrated with any of your DevOps uh, tools. Data generated can be direct data values and can be used as values in Excel, CSVs, and can become your driving content for most of your test automation activities. Data generated in this manner can also be inserted into respective tables of the application. This way, all the data conditions that have to be validated can be readily available for all the QA teams, including your manual testing team. If you look at the picture, uh, there is a service orchestration layer um, to bring that point. So data need not always be in the forms of columns or tables, right? So many applications depend on the underlying web services, microservices for, for retrieving data. As explained earlier, the input data itself can be in JSON schemas of the of the defined web services, right? And the and the output can also be generated in JSON and XMLs. So data generated in JSON can be fed to a service virtualization module that can mimic a real service and respond back the synthetic data in the form of JSON in, in the form of JSON, right? So. At PK, we have actually implemented all these three types of TDM solutions uh, with, with the synthetic data generation for, for, uh, for, a, for, a, for, a, for a service virtualization, for a direct DB 
uh, integration and also for enabling test automation with uh, integration with their pipeline. Okay, we'll move on to a, a quick demo, right? So Ross, when you want to start playing, yeah. So this is the interface of the synthetic data generation solution that we have built. This interface has been built to showcase more than one domain. As you can see, there are three telecom banking and healthcare. We'll see both banking and telecom examples. Um, training data has been fed to the solution external to this interface. Are the, so these fields, as, as you are seeing, uh, the user is seeding the, in, seeding the information, right? So account type is individual, band status, billing account number uh, status is open. So when he, so basically he's requesting data of 150 different records, uh, as you can see the record count, right? So to generate with this data conditions, right? So my underlying program is trying to parse the training data, extract the metadata characteristics, use or apply these conditions that user has seeded and then generate 150 records. You can see that it got generated and you can see 150 at the bottom right and then you can you can actually see there are more than what are uh, 10 columns here because these are all the columns that have been defined in the training data user has only seeded this input so he wants ban as open right so you can see ban status as o and account type as individual i in this case that means it is generating relevant data as requested by the user we also have an option to download and then uh, use it in Excel. Uh, we can we can have Excel or CSV or a flat file download option. We can move to the banking option. So we are showing there. So till now we have seen a string based user seeding, but uh, there might be numerical values and numerical values have more conditions. As you can see, I might want to choose less than 30,000 as my credit limit and uh, less than 50 as my interest, right? Or uh, I can choose greater than or some kind of mathematical relation with the numeric. And also I, I have a combination of numerical and a card type as gold. Here I'm trying to load 2,000 records, right? And try to generate 2,000 records. And when I generate, now it should be able to apply these conditions, uh, use the metadata extraction logic that we have built, and then generate. On the right side, you can see some of those fields. Those are the extra fields that the program would actually generate, right? So account number, first name, last name, these are the ones that we don't really have to, user would not request any condition on them. So those would be the randomly generated data. As you can see, the 2000 records got generated. It has a pagination on the bottom and you can see card type is only gold because that is the condition that user has requested and credit limit is less than 30 and interest is less than 50. One example I was talking about earlier of um, externally fed rules would be a, a IMEA number for a for a telecom customer, right? So IMEA number usually follows a, um, a specific algorithm called Lunds algorithm. I, I cannot generate uh, a random number and it would work as an IMEA, right? So I will have to have a specific rule that has been predefined so that IMEA numbers come in that format. So these are the 2000 records that have been downloaded and this can be used for your automation. So in, in, in some customer areas, we have built solution that can directly be integrated with their service virtualization platform or directly have option to load the data into their tables of their application. Thank you, Ross. Over to you. I think we are done with the demo. Thanks, Kasha. Appreciate that demo. And as you can see, um, that was our, our patented um, synthetic data platform that uh, we showed you the, the UI version of it. And as Kashyap said, um, you can also pass SQL commands to it through the API and generate the data in a format that will work um, directly with your pipeline. In this case, the, the demo was able to show us exactly how um, the generation algorithm works and, and what our um, 
target data set can look like. Um, we've seen these solutions result in incredible um, benefit and savings to our clients. Uh, in one instance, our platform drives a high volume test data generation for a mainframe based transaction authorization system. Um, our platform generates synthetic test data records that we merge with proprietary authentication tokens to perform these tests. The result is hundreds of hours of savings every month for each group that leverages it, um, which in turn um, works out to be millions of dollars of savings every year in, in um, the cost of, of trying to acquire and manage test data. Uh, in another implementation, in order to run their tests, a QA team has to use actual electronic medical record ID numbers, but they have limited access to them. Uh, testing would come to a halt as the team waited for these IDs to be assigned to them by a different group. And often when the data was assigned to them, it, it was expired or spoiled and no longer useful to the team. So they would have to turn around and make another request, resulting in an even longer time cycle to, to acquire the test data to execute the tests. As Kashif described earlier, in this case, we integrated our synthetic data generation engine with our service virtualization platform to generate the required test data in line with the automation pipeline. We were able to remove dependencies on external groups for test data, speeding up the time to execute test cases from weeks to minutes as a result of gathering the data. This frees up the automation team to run these tests as often as needed, multiple times per day if necessary so that the releases can get out quicker. And with all of the, man, the demand these days in healthcare, this is enabling uh, teams to respond um, much faster to the demand of um, software updates. We have several other examples and each one's unique because each one of our client systems and data requirements are unique. Um, and with that, the algorithms required to generate the data are unique. Um, but in every case, the reduced cost and increased speed brings real results to our clients. Their DevOps pipelines are able to move at the intended speeds to get the releases out. And now we're gonna move to our time of questions and answers. And we've got um, several that have come in and we wanna take some time to answer those. Um, Rich, looks like the first question might be for you. How much data science knowledge is needed to implement something like this? Uh, <clears throat> Well, uh, the way that I would answer that is, is a fair amount. So the machine learning algorithm that we use uh, on the back end um, uh, requires some know-how, but in order to drive it, um, you know, in order to implement this in your, in your organization, not that much is required. You just need to be proficient with, with, uh, Python. It's, it's not a big deal. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another question, what's the difference between your solution and a data masking or data scrambling solution? And I'll go ahead and answer that one. And then um, we hope that it's uh, um, fairly obvious, but um, in a data masking or data scrambling solution, the, the tool takes typically takes production data and modifies that. But these regulations that we've been talking about um, now um, make that not an option without uh, um, coming into serious fines. And so the, the difference in our solution is though, though it may use production data to build um, some training data, ultimately the data that's produced and tested has no um, ties to um, the specific production data. Um, and so therefore it um, is, uh, uh, easily able to be used where data restrictions are in place. Um, got another question. This one looks like it might be for you, Kashyap. Uh, looks like all the test data is of a valid type. Uh, can the system also generate all types of invalid data that users normally feed in that can cause an issue and might only get caught in production? Yes. Yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, unless, I mean, uh, if you have a good amount of training data that, that uh, surrounds all the possible conditions, we should be able to generate. I'm, 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 
understanding based on your question that you are looking at the boundary conditions of a regular data set right if i have a positive data set you might have a lot of boundary conditions so thinking about that in one of our customers what we have implemented is we have given them an option uh, to to as a, as a flag to let us know if they want to generate all the boundary data around the positive data that we are generating right so that that also but only thing is when we generate we'll also we'll also have to tell them on the screen or whatever the amount of uh, whatever the format that we give excel or csv that this is the positive data and this is the negative condition data so that they can appropriately use it for their uh, usage right great thanks kashap and then one more question and it's also to you kashap uh, mm -hmm. what if my schema changes do i have to rebuild this whole approach mm -hmm. Uh, I would say no, but then there would be a minimal change required depending on what kind of solution you have implemented, right? So if if you if you think about uh, a service virtualization based solution that we have implemented, where we get a schema, there is typically my JSON or my contract based on the web service that has been implemented, right? Um, the current solution that we have built would should be able to handle most of the cases, but if it's a drastic change to the schema, yes, there might be some uh, minimal change that is required to your code. Whereas if it is a database schema change, right? And uh, if you are trying to load the data into a into a database, usually we handle that with a preloaded script, right? So if you know that there is a change to your database, upfront give that as a uh, as a as an option into your solution, saying there has been a change. Uploads up, upload to database DDL, DDL scripts or the alter scripts, and it should be able to take care. Great, thank you. Um, that is all the time we have for questions. Uh, we're gonna just wrap it up here. And with that, I wanna just let you know, um, as a follow-up, that there are several workshops and upcoming webinars that we are offering. Um, the list is here on the screen and also available on, on the events page of our website, pkglobal.com. Uh, in addition, those uh, you should be receiving an email at the end of this with a link to this webinar and also with information about these upcoming um, events that, uh, um, that are coming up. So we just wanna take a moment and say thank you. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate your time today. If you'd like to learn more, you can email us directly. You can scan the QR code and that will lead you to our marketing website. Um, we'd love to interact more with you about how to solve your test data um, management challenges as well as other automation challenges that you might be facing. Um, again, thank you for your time. Be well um, and stay healthy and safe.